please welcome Reverend Michael Record. Thank you, Sandy. Good morning, friends. Good morning, morning Reverend Michael. I add my welcome to all those worshiping at the Sunday morning service in the sanctuary at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, as well as those joining in online. It is a lovely morning. Beautiful flowers, grass, trees, sky, the sunlight is golden. And it was made all more beautiful by this lovely baby blessing ceremony, which we have just had. Wonderful. My talk today is on the basics of our teaching. So longtime members will be getting a refresher course, while newcomers, and I especially welcome the newcomers, you may hear some surprising things about how the universe works. I want to start with asking you to repeat after me the opening paragraph of an affirmative prayer which I happened upon yesterday in a book in which it is published. It is an affirmative prayer by one of our ministers. I will not say who, but you may guess from the consciousness behind the words. And my talk this morning is basically on consciousness. Please repeat after me. Infinite mind being infinitely creative. Expresses its unbounded joy in and through all creation. I am made in the image and likeness of God. a light-hearted product of the cosmic perfection. Shines through everything and everyone. In unique, diverse, and innumerable ways. Thank you. All of the ministers and others were published in this now defunct series, Creative Thought, and that is by one of the ministers. I will say not now who it is. I won't tell you who it is, but you may guess. My title is Life is Consciousness, Placebos, Nocebos, and Habits. And you'll notice it contains five big words. I will define only four of them. And I will leave the one that is ironically the shortest, life. Scientists and philosophers are still struggling to find a satisfactory definition for life. When they come up with one, I promise I will report back to you. <laughs> For a def definition of the longest word, consciousness, I refer you to Ernest Holmes, the founder of our teaching, philosophy, and religion. It's called religious science, also known as science of mind. In the glossary of his acclaimed book, the science of mind, Dr. Holmes states that consciousness is, I quote, mental awareness. And he explains that there are two types of consciousness, objective and subjective. 
Our objective consciousness is the conscious mind. The part of our mind under our voluntary control. Subjective consciousness is the sense of mind term for what psychologists call our subconscious mind. Dr. Holmes calls it subjective. The two terms are, have different connotations, but I won't go into them here. In explaining placebo, that is the other, one of the other words we want to define, I go to Dr. John Waterhouse, past president of CSL. He points out that, and I quote, the placebo effect has fascinated and challenged medical researchers for generations. How can we know that a drug helps resolve a physical issue when simply telling someone that it may help? has its own substantial effects, he asks. And he continues, I quote, researchers work diligently to explain in scientific terms how placebo treatments, which are interventions with no proven value, can stimulate real physiological responses, such as improved heart rates, lowered blood pressure, and even increased brain functioning. In documented studies, the placebo effect has been shown to eliminate pain, anxiety, depression, fatigue, and a wide range of other symptoms." Unquote. Let me be clear. What the ailing people got and reacted positively to was a fake drug. It had no proven efficacy. The effect was due purely to their expectation, which I'm calling for today their consciousness. In the essay, Dr. Waterhouse then writes about the other term that I want to def define. Nocebos. The first was placebos. This one is nocebos. And he says, when a patient is advised of possible negative side effects, their likelihood of those side effects occurring skyrockets. This has come to be known as the nocebo effect. So placebo's effects are positive reactions. Nocebo effects are negative. Both come from the mere suggestion that the thing given is effective. The central point of Dr. Waterhouse's essay, and my major point in this talk, is that the placebo effect is integral to the human condition. I quote, it's the way we human beings are wired and fits perfectly into the principles of science of mind. Through our thinking and our emotional state, we create the state of our, of, our, of our physical bodies and all of our affairs. So whether we call it the placebo effect, spontaneous healing, of so, or something else, it's God as you that is creating your life now and always, whatever you call it. Now, when we want to differentiate between religious science, our teaching, and the traditional mainstream religions, we call them orthodoxy. Except that a little thought makes you realize that we are the orthodox ones. We more closely follow the teachings of Jesus, who 2,000 years or so ago gave us the fundamental recipe for success and happiness in just one sentence. I quote, it is done unto you as you believe, unquote. Of course, he was talking about consciousness. 
making in a slightly different way our well-known statement that our consciousness outpictures as the conditions and events in our lives. New thought, that's us, another term for us. And relig orthodox religions interpret Jesus' statement, it is done unto you as you believe, in different ways. And that may well be the most important difference between new thought and mainstream religions. They teach that Jesus was saying that when you have faith in God, he will do something out of the ordinary to grant your wish or manifest your prayer. It's something he goes out of his way to do, out of the goodness of his heart. And he does it because of your beseeching, maybe begging, and he might not have done it otherwise. But science of mind takes Jesus literally. We believe that when you ask God for something, perhaps in a quick conversation or more formally in prayer, what you ask for will be done unto you as you believe. Meaning, in the moment you believe it, and to the degree that you believe it. It's automatic, it's natural, it is the way that the universe works. When you ask God for something, it is done unto you as you believe, stated Jesus 2,000 odd years ago. The universe, meaning God, can only say yes to the request made by our state of consciousness. We, sense of mind, believe the manifestation depends on, your, on you through your consciousness, but orthodoxy believes that the manifestation depends on God's pleasure at the particular moment. You can see that sense of mind and Jesus are in agreement because in a number of other instances, Jesus says, and I paraphrase, it's your faith that does the job. You remember, it's your faith that make, um, makes you whole, etc. And this is in the instances of healing of a servant, the raising of a dead daughter, the healing of a withered hand, the healing of leprosy. You know the Bible stories I'm referring to, I believe. I'll briefly define the Fourth big word, habit, as a mental or physical activity that you regularly do automatically without thinking. And then I'll tell you a story which you may be familiar with in order to illustrate an important facet of God. Here is a story. The weatherman had predicted flood rains in the area that Sunday, and the pastor urged his congregation to go straight home after service. He would stay back and protect the church. The deluge did come, and not only the grounds, but also the floor of the church were soon covered with water. The pastor climbed up the stairs to the pulpit, just in time to see his car float by outside. He also saw a boat being rowed by one of his congregants arrive at the door. The congregant called out to him to get in as the forecast was that the rains would last for days. I'm okay, called the pastor. God will save me. So the congregant rode away, muttering something which the pastor didn't hear under his breath. The water continued to rise and the pastor had to move up into the attic. From there he saw a motorboat with two of his congregants come to the window. They shouted for him to jump down into the boat. I'm okay, he yelled back. God will save me and they motored away. 
saying something to each other which the pastor again couldn't quite make up because of the pounding of the rain on the roof which was where the rising water in the church next forced him to go. From there, he saw a helicopter with three of his congregants inside hovering overhead. One let down a rope ladder with, and signaled to the pastor to climb up. The pastor shouted to them to leave him as he had faith that God would save him. The helicopter flew away. Well, the water continued to rise because the rain continued to fall. And the pastor had nowhere else to climb, so he drowned. Of course, he went to heaven, which he was happy for. But he still had a question for God. Why didn't you save me? You know how much faith I had in you. Beloved was the reply. I did send two boats and a helicopter. The main lesson to be drawn from the story is, of course, that God's, God works through people. He was not going to literally reach down from above and lift the pastor to safety onto some mountaintop which seems to be what the pastor expected. But I want you to consider another issue. How did God speak to the would-be rescuers? Probably not in a dream or by sending an angel with the instructions or speaking in a loud voice from heaven. All methods the Bible tells us he has used. He probably did it naturally by simply allowing the rescuers to think about rescuing their pastor. And if God did speak to them naturally in their thoughts through nature, that suggests that he was in the phenomenon of nature called the flood rain. A discussion of the implications of that statement would lead us into considering the nature of God, which is for another time. Let me get back to my theme, life is consciousness. Some of you know the booklet with that title. I got mine in our book room, a little booklet. It is the transcript of a talk given in 1936 by Emmett Fox, a divine science minister at the Church of the Healing Christ in New York. And it is recognized as a classic New Thought document. Fox writes, I quote, the truth movement which centers on the belief in the omnipresence and availability of God is the most important thing in the world because it is the only thing that can save the world. The belief in the omnipresence and availability of God is the only thing that can save the world. Nothing else can. Everything else has been tried. It's a big claim, and he explains how it works. The truth movement, he says, quotes, takes hold of people, changes them, restores health, health if that has been lost, restores estate if that has been lost, restores self-esteem if that has been lost. It puts people on their feet and shows them that there is something worth living for." Unquote. A lot of us listening here in the sanctuary and online can testify that that is what God does. We have the key to life, Fox continues. We do not approach life from a particular angle as other schools of healing do. And that key is, is that life is a state of consciousness. The explanation for all your problems, the explanation of all your difficulties, the explanations of your triumph in life boil down to this statement, life is a state of consciousness. 
And he says, if you don't like what you see on the screen of your life, don't try to change the screen directly. Change the source of what is being projected onto the screen. Dr. Elmer Lumsden, the founder of this church, used to say, if you don't like what you see in the mirror, don't change the mirror. Change the source of the image, which may be yourself. And Dr. Fox gets very specific about how you use the key. Take note, most people who have a problem concentrate on the problem. They take it to bed with them and stay awake all night thinking about the problem. Let go of the problem. Rise above it in consciousness. That is the key. Now, Dr. Bernie Siegel, in his book, Love, Medicine, and Miracles, tells a story that amazingly illustrates the power of consciousness. A patient, Mr. Wright, had terminal cancer of his lymph systems. Tumors the size of oranges littered his neck, his armpit, his groin, his chest, etc. I'll spare you further details. Despite the state, his state, despite being told he had a short time to live, Mr. Wright had hope because he had heard of a new drug being tested and though he didn't qualify, he begged his doctor to give it to him and the doctor decided that he would. He gave the injection on a Friday thinking that by Monday, Mr. Wright would be dead. The doctor was in for a surprise. The man who had been bedridden on Friday was on Monday walking around the ward, climbing, chatting up the nurses. I quote, the tumor masses had melted like snowballs on a hot stove and in only three days, they were half their original size. So he continued to give the injections three times daily as had been planned. And within days, the formerly terminally ill patient was discharged from hospital. Practically all signs of the disease had vanished. Unfortunately, the newspapers reporters did some research and they found out that the drug that had been touted by all was in fact quite useless. When Mr. Wright heard this, he called the doctor, spoke to the doctor about it, and he was so disappointed that he started getting ill again. But the doctor who realized what was going on told the Mr. Wright that in, in fact the drug was effective and in a few days he'd be getting a new super refined double strength samples of the drug. He called in Mr. Wright, injected him with a new drug, or so Mr. Wright thought, actually the, the injection was fresh water. But Mr. Wright, who had been falling back, relapsing, recovered rapidly, in fact, even more rapidly than before. Again, the tumors melted, chest fluid vanished, etc., and he was back to flying his plane again. And then, unfortunately, the story reappeared in the press that the drug was indeed ruthless. Mr. Wright read the stories, and within days, he was readmitted to hospital, and his faith gone, he died. Dr. Siegel's book is full of stories like that. The use of placebos in those instances prove placebos, quite fake drugs, eh? having no value, prove scientifically that your mind can heal or hurt you. And not just in a trivial way. We're talking about good health or poor health, even about life and death. I turn to the importance of habits and go to Stephen Covey's bestseller, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'll very quickly tell you what those habits are because he says, if you adopt those habits, you too can become successful. And I mean 
multimillionaire success group, not just ordinarily wealthy. His seven habits are, one, be proactive. In any relationship, act first, take the initiative. Don't react to what other people do. do. Number two, begin with the end in mind. That is, envisage the final product or condition or goal that you desire to achieve and work backwards from it to see what steps you need to take you to the goal. Number three, put first things first. Make a list of the things you have to do each day or each week or each year and do the most important one first. Don't try to take a second step before taking the first one. It's actually impossible, no matter how athletic you are. Number four, think win-win. And thinking win-win means this. Take the action that will result in both you and the person you are dealing with winning. Both of you will be winning, not one of you losing. Number five, Seek first to understand, then be understood. That is, listen to the other person and see where he or she is coming from, and then put forward your own position. Number six, synergize. That is, create a situation in which all your assets, or all the parts of the machine, or all the people in, in, the, in the situation work together to achieve the objective, synergize, work together. And number seven, sharpen the saw. Regularly refresh yourself in all four of your dom domains or your dimensions. And I mean by that, take care of yourself spiritually, physically, mentally, and socially slash emotionally. And Kobe says, those people who he interviewed, hundreds of them, take, make these actions and attitudes habits. And you too, if you too want to be successful, adopt those habits. So that you are in, in argument with a friend, for example, do you automatically think win-win? And do you find a way for both of you to feel good at the end of the argument? Do you first seek to understand your friend's point before making your own? I'm asking you to think about yourself, what you do in relationships. What is your habit in discussions? What is your habit when you get out of bed in the morning? Do you work backwards to figure out what steps you're going to take to reach the goal that you probably set? the night before. Some people just go with the flow of the river in their life, and that is not what Kove would have us do. That is not what he found the most successful people do. I'll close with an anecdote that illustrates what Kove, Stephen Kove, meant by habits. A writer was asked if he waited on inspiration or set regular working habits when he was writing. He replied that he always waited on inspiration. But fortunately, inspiration came every morning at nine o'clock when he sat down at his desk to write. Want to be successful? Go thou and do likewise. Namaste meaning the God in me greets the God in you. Thank you, Reverend Michael, for that reminder that life is consciousness. We learned about placebos, nocebos, and, and habits, and that through our thinking and emotional effect, we create the conditions of our affairs and our physical bodies. And that, remember that it is done unto you as, it, as you believe. And in the moment, uh, it happens in the moment that you believe it and to the degree that you believe it. 
It is your faith that makes you whole. Thanks again, Reverend Michael.